why do we grow plants in pots? Um, does anybody have some ideas about why they might find that to be a better strategy? If you're comfortable speaking up, and if not, I can just talk right through. So, so some of the reasons why we might grow in a container, it's convenient, right? So if your plot of land might be farther out in the backyard, it's a little further from your, from your living room or kitchen, you may not be walking out there every day to take care of your garden. So it's convenient. It's portable. So I used to call my garden my portable garden. I, I used to think I couldn't garden because I didn't have space and I moved around every other year. I, I was a vagabond, a little gypsy, and I jumped around living in different places, doing ski resort towns. And um, I always thought I couldn't, I couldn't garden. And then one year I decided, you know what, I'm just going to do it. And if I move, I can give my garden to someone. Well, instead, I realized I could hire a U-Haul and I moved all of my plants in a U-Haul to Nevada. And they did just great. So it's nice. It's portable. You can you can take it <laughs> from house to house or space to space. You have a little bit more control over your soil. So if you live in an area of town where there might have been a big industrial, um, you know, com commerce there, industrial business there um, at some point over the past, let's say, 100 years, and there's contamination in the soil. This was something that was a real issue in Massachusetts where I went to grad school. You, had, you couldn't grow food. Lead was an issue with the paint that, that they used to use. And they had a big industrial boom, um, you know, years and years and years ago. And now a lot of those, those buildings lay derelict and unused and just continue to contaminate the soil. So in Massachusetts, where I was at, you had to, to test your soil to make sure it was safe. So <laughs> if you couldn't grow in the crown, it, growing in a raised bed or growing in containers was a really viable option. You can also maximize your space. If you have a small amount of space, you can utilize that vertical space to grow food. If you have a balcony, it's actually pretty incredible what you can grow and how much food you can get from that balcony space, utilizing your vertical space. And we can talk more about that. And pest control. <laughs> if you have pests in the soil, nematodes, for example, which is a microscopic pest that sucks at the roots of your, of your plants, you can control <laughs> control that by growing in a container. And then lastly, one of my favorites is it creates a green space, a little greenscape for you. So if you just have a patio um, or you just have a balcony and, and no green space, this can introduce that for you. Does anyone have questions so far? Okay, and um, Vanya, I might, because it's hard to follow the um, comments, if there's any comments, are you comfortable just um, letting me know? Yeah, of course. Okay, okay. perfect. <clears throat> All right. So first thing you want to think about when you're doing a container garden is you want to think about your containers. Um, that can really make or break the garden. Um, there's different kinds of containers to consider. If you live in a really hot climate, terracotta containers can be great but they can also dry out your, uh, your plants. So this terracotta is this first one on the left, on the top, top left. Um, terracotta is great because it's porous. It allows for a lot of breathability in the um, soil for your roots, but it also can heat up and it can wick moisture. So in the summertime, if you're growing something that really likes a lot of moisture, it's a moisture loving plant, this might not be your best option. If you're growing something that likes dry roots, that likes uh, minimal water, succulents, uh, cactus, this is a, a wonderful option for you. A glazed pot, it could be terracotta, it could be other <laughs> some other kind of clay, but because it has that glaze over it, it won't do the wicking and it won't dry up as fast. So this might be a solution to the person that likes the terracotta pot, but doesn't want their soil to dry out so quickly and they might have a more moisture loving plant. They also, the glaze pots are really pretty. So for aesthetics, that can be a great option too. Plastic is really nice. Um, if you're okay with growing your edibles in plastic, they're, they're usually pretty um, safe as far as chemicals go these days. And the plastic are nice because they're lightweight. So if you need to move them around for any reason, maybe certain times of the year, you get direct sunlight on one side of your balcony and not the other. And so when, when uh, the wet or times of year change, you might need to move it that's gonna allow you to easily be able to pick it up and move it to a location that's more ideal for sunlight. 
So that's that's a good reason to, to have that. And they, they're fairly durable as well. Wood is great. If you're gonna use a wood container, my recommendation is that you make sure it's not pressure treated or treated with any chemicals. And that's for um, edible food. So if you're growing a, um, if you're growing ornamentals, that's a different different situation. You're probably fine. Um, wood can be a little bit heavier and it can weather. So you want to be mindful that it may break down over time. So you want to think about how long do you want this this um, pot or this little garden in there? And if it's a couple of years, three years, you're probably fine. Window boxes are fantastic for balconies. I put this in here because, with very little space and it can hang over the ledge, it's a great option. One thing to keep in mind is they do tend to be a little more shallow, so it will limit what you grow in there. And we'll talk to you about more about what plants can grow in what size containers. You also wanna make sure that <laughs> when it drains out, it's not gonna be draining onto another person's patio or space where they might um, stand or sit or hang around and, and, and get a little, little drench from us. Um, and then of course, making sure that you properly mount it because you wouldn't want it to fall on anybody or you wouldn't want to destroy your garden by it dropping from your balcony. And then lastly on here, I have hanging baskets. Same thing with hanging baskets um, as with window boxes, you want to make sure that you have sturdy hardware and that you found a solid place that's going to support it um, and not cause any issues around safety. And these are fun because especially for accessibility, these can, these can be hung at a height that's great for you. So if you want it right at a height that's comfortable for you to garden, um, whether that be waist height, shoulder height, um, you, can, you can play with that height. And so this is also a nice option. You don't have to bend over necessarily to work in, in your little garden space. Any questions so far? That's good. Okay, I hope I don't get through this too quickly. If you guys have questions, please feel free to stop me. And if you have any um, anything that you wanna add, any little tricks um, that you have found very helpful, please uh, feel free to do that too. So my favorite type of container is an improvised container. And so this one is where you get a chance to be super creative you get to think more about our environment um, and that you're upcycling things rather than throwing them in a landfill. <laughs> and then again, the, the creativity part of this is really fun. You can see that there's over here, somebody uh, repurposed some rain boots and they're growing some plants out of the rain boots. I think it's brilliant, super cute. Um, I've done them out of bras, you know, I've just taken a, a, a piece of, um, cloth and sewn it in so it holds the soil in and it's just fun to hang them up on a wall. I've done them out of boots. I saw someone growing ones out of a urinal on a wall. I thought that was brilliant and funny. Um, I think if you work in a restaurant or have in the past or have family members that do and they get fish in daily, they get these little plastic tubs that the fish come in and I um, grew a lot of things in that when I was a server. You can see over here, this is a five gallon um, paint bucket. These are fantastic for growing your determinate tomatoes in or your patio tomatoes. And the reason why I say those two varieties is because this is a five gallon uh, pot. And so determinate tomatoes, they grow only to a certain height and they don't need as much space. So a five gallon container like this one would be fantastic or a patio tomato, which is made for a smaller container. In this particular instance, they are growing, <laughs> they're growing their tomato upside down, which is fun. Um, again, this makes it more accessible and easy to harvest. Makes it can a little ask, harder. Oh, can ahead. I ask a quick question? Uh, yeah. You said determinate tomatoes. When I yeah. shop for tomato plants, I normally don't see that terminology. You should see it. Um, it's one thing that it, it may be because you maybe you weren't familiar with it, it didn't pop out right away, but it should be there more often than not. I even see them now at um, Home Depot. And the reason why is because it's gonna help you decide what kind of container of space you need. So is that's really in the title, when you see the type of tomato plant, uh -huh. it should say determinate. 
it usually will say it, it'll say the type of tomato, it'll say it's, and then it'll say the type of tomato and then beneath it, it'll say determinant or indeterminate. There's two okay. types of tomatoes. Thank you. Okay. And if it, look. <laughs> if it doesn't say that right beneath the name, it may have, it may have been missed because maybe it talks about its planting needs, like needs full sun. You know, they'll talk about the planting needs on the tag. And then that might also be beneath the planting needs. Okay. So somewhere on there, it really should say <laughs> if it's a determinant or an indeterminate. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, of course. Thanks for asking. An indeterminate tomato, uh, just to follow through with, with this conversation, is something that it's a tomato plant that will grow almost infinitely. Like I've had them grow up to, you know, a story high and they're kind of toppling over. Um, and growing on the ground. And I've built structures where I've actually tied the uh, the limbs up, the stems up. And it's amazing how much they will continue to grow and they will produce so many tomatoes. Where an indeterminate tomato plant, it's a little bit more um, compact. You have a little bit more control of its space. <laughs> and it tends to produce <laughs> all the tomatoes at one time or in a short period of time where indeterminate will, for the life of the tomato plant, continue to produce. I've had it even produce into the winter sometimes. They can be a lot more aggressive at times. Um, the, the tomatoes tend to be a little less sweet because they don't have the heat and the sunlight that you get in the summer if you're growing them in the winter. And um, a lot of tomatoes won't thrive in that condition, but there are some varieties that will. And just to add to, um, to the last question about those labels and how they're labeled some gardens you'll still see tomatoes being sold in the winter and it will say it'll say a winter variety on there so it'll say determinate indeterminate and it will say if it's a winter variety and that just means that it's it can grow with less sunlight and less heat and again those tomatoes so, so for example would be a glacier tomato or a stupus tomato or an oregon spring tomato those three will be sold at um, stores in the winter and they just tend to be a little less sweet, but they'll, they're still great. I think they'll beat a, a store-bought tomato at any time. There was a question in the chat as well from Chris. Um, okay. I have some tall wood box containers. I know that over time they will decay due to water exposure. I did some research and found one site that a gardener recommends um, protecting the inner surface of the box <laughs> with roof cement. Um, he's, uh, they've heard that lining the boxes with plastic liner as well. Uh, but what do you think about roof cement to paint on the inner side of the box? You know, I've never looked into roof cement, so I, I wouldn't be able to speak to that one. I, I don't know what chemicals are in cement. I think cement is a fairly basic, um, recipe. Um, I think it's, and I think it's fairly natural ingredients in there that make cement I, I'm not sure I, I don't want anyone to quote me on that because I'm not I'm not familiar um but yes as far as a garden plastic goes absolutely and that's probably something you that's a lot more common than uh putting cement in there because also if you paint it with that cement I don't know what the drainage will look like but you can definitely get some drainage when you use the the garden plastic and and you can create some drainage in there as well it's a lot easier but that will help protect against any of the uh, contaminants that might come out of the wood and it'll also help preserve the length or the time of the wood because it's not being as exposed as frequently to the water when you're watering watering your garden. Does that help answer it a bit? Hopefully. And you can get that garden plastic for lining your raised beds or, or in this case, your, um, your wooden containers, you can get that at any, any garden store. And I would definitely get, I would definitely get a garden plastic because again, I, I just always worry about any kind of chemicals that are in the, <laughs> the products that we use if it's not specific for gardening. Okay. So in this, just to go off the rest of the pictures in here so you know what they're using. In the top right corner, this is this top right corner black one, that's a grow bag. So that is specific <coughs> for container gardening. Um, you can buy those on Amazon. They're really cheap and they're very light. The one to the left here, which I guess is in the middle of the top page, that one there is just maybe like your farmer's, your farmer's carry bag um, or farmer um, 
it's a bag, right? It's, a, it's one of those um, reusable bags. And those are great too. What I, I wanna caution people for those is that you wanna use a fabric porous one. Sometimes you go to Whole Foods, they give you one that has a plastic, um, out, like the, the, the outside of the bag is more of a plastic type product and it doesn't allow for drainage. And so that one is not ideal for growing plants in. And so you do wanna find the more porous fabric type. And then this one's this one I think is ingenious. They're growing out of a kid's pool. So this is a great option for growing several tomatoes. And um, even, you know, you could even grow some greens in there beneath the tomatoes. You could really utilize that and maximize that space with that pool. Um, a few more things to point out with improvised containers. If, if you like getting creative and you want to go this route and save some money, <laughs> we talked about making sure it's free of contaminants. So if you're just not sure. Um, maybe you can do a little Google search. Do kiddie pools usually have any kind of contaminants that might be a concern for growing food? Or um, if you, you're you using an Ikea furniture, for example, they probably would have a little bit more idea if you did a Google search, what kind of chemicals might be in that wood, they might be treated. In that case, you can always line it with plastic. And then when you're when you're picking your container, of course, you're going to want to think about what plant it is you want to grow. And we'll talk more about the space that they might need. <clears throat> and I apologize, everyone, for my cough. I have allergies this time of year. And so this cough has been a month and a half now, which is a real bummer. <laughs> All right. So where do we find containers? This might seem like com common knowledge to most, but if, if you're not... Um, one that stores a lot of things around your house after you've used it, you may not know where to go. Um, thrift stores are a really great spot for this. You can find all kinds of things. I've actually grown plants out of a tea kettle that I got for $2 at the thrift store. That was really cool. Um, you can go uh, into, I mean, your neighbor's garage. If you're, if they, if you don't have things in your own garage, you don't keep uh, items once they're, you've used them. There's always somebody that thinks that there'll be a use later on down the road for items and keep them. I mean, I could name off probably at least five people I could go to their house and find something. Um, hopefully the same for you. So you can definitely go to the friend's um, garage. You can check your hallway closet. Sometimes this is a great time to start clearing out things we haven't been using and we just haven't realized we haven't gone back and done an inventory and maybe there's no more use for that and you decide you can grow some food in it or grow um, grow some flowers in it. And then <laughs> recycle bins. You know, there's a lot of things that people throw in their recycle bins. You can grow out of the water gallon jugs. That's a really fun one. You just have to make holes at the bottom and you can easily grow in that <clears throat> um, several carrots. You could grow Swiss chard. You could grow lettuce. The depth of that container is really nice for plants that don't need a lot of space, but just need depth like carrots. <clears throat> Um, things to consider when selecting your container, make sure it's the right size. So when we talk about size, we can probably jump into that right now. Um, for size, and, and I'll tell you kind of a general a general rule, and if anybody wants to jump in and, and tell me what kind of plants you want to grow and want me to tell you what size or container to look for, I'm happy to do that. But for your two to three gallon container, you could easily grow bell peppers, hot peppers, <clears throat> eggplants, kale, Swiss chard, leafy greens, such as lettuce or arugula or spinach. All of those are viable options for a two to three gallon container. And, and people are always surprised by the pepper and eggplant, but they actually don't need a lot of root space to, to thrive. <clears throat> for your five gallon containers, which would be <laughs> the size of that Home Depot paint bucket. You can grow squash in there. You can grow cherry tomatoes in there. And, and again, cherry tomatoes are like cherry or patio tomatoes. They, they grow in smaller spaces or what we talked about, determinate tomatoes. They can grow in a five gallon. <clears throat> if you're looking to grow something that um, throws out lots of vines and needs lots of space or uh, well, such as like melons. Melons, you really would want about a 10 gallon or larger container. Um, those Rubbermaid tubs tend to be closer to that size. <laughs> so if you have any of those around your house, 
<clears throat> excuse me, you can use that. Um, indeterminate tomatoes also will need about a 10 gallon space. You can grow them in a five gallon. They just won't thrive as well or produce as much tomatoes for you. But if that's your only option and you're really set on growing an indeterminate variety, it's juicy, it's wonderful, it's one of your favorites, go for it. You just got to know you probably won't, it won't live as long because it will outgrow that space and it won't produce as many tomatoes, but you'll still get plenty. Um, indeterminate tomatoes are, are pretty aggressive and um, they will shoot out a lot of fruit. Questions on that so far? <clears throat> um, for sh more shallow containers, like the ones that you, you saw hanging over a balcony ledge or for those smaller um, box, the long smaller like wooden box containers, you can grow beans, you can grow peas, you can grow lettuce, arugula. I think you could even get away with radishes because they're not, they're a root vegetable, but they're not very long. <laughs> and then of course, almost all of those, you're fine for growing um, more of like your ornamental flowers. Now, when it gets to like shrubs and bushes, of course, that's a different story. But um, a lot of your, like your pansies, <clears throat> your daisies, your nasturtiums, your um, all those different kinds of flowers will grow just fine in all those containers. <clears throat> so then you want to think about the weight, of course. If you're hanging your pot, <clears throat> you want something that's not going to be super heavy. <clears throat> if you need, excuse me. <clears throat> My apologies, everyone. These allergies are horrible. Mm. If you need to move your containers at any point, you want to think about a lightweight container. If you live in an area where maybe there's a lot of wind exposure, a heavier container might be your choice because it's going to be a little bit more durable and stay in place, a more solid. Um, for strength, again, this kind of comes into play with how long do you want your your container to last? Are you hoping that to grow, you're growing something that could grow for two or three seasons or two or three years, and you want to continue um, until the life of that, that plant is done. So you want to think about a very um, strong and durable pot. Um, again, your terracotta pots, as long as they don't get dropped, they're pretty durable. Your glazed pots, plastic can last about that long. It will start to break down over time and get a little thinner, but that will work. Um, the ones that come to mind that I wouldn't do if it's a plant that will grow for several seasons would be your, um, some of your improvised like shoes or uh, boots like we saw on there or your reusable grocery bags. Those break down within a season generally. So I wouldn't use those. <clears throat> um, sturdiness. I'm trying to remember why I differentiated between strength and sturdiness. I think they kind of go hand in hand. Um, you, you want to make sure that it's sturdy. It's not something that's going to, you know, fall over. It's got a good base to it because it's going to be a bummer if you're growing something and you're getting close to harvest and that doesn't have a very good base and somebody easily knocks it over your pet and then it's done. <clears throat> and then drainage, that is key. Uh, most plants do not like what we call wet feet. They don't like their roots to get too much moisture. There can be root rot fungal growth when that happens. And so we're not setting <clears throat> our plants up for success if there's no drainage. So always know that there's got to be um, some sort of option for that, whether it be taking a drill bit and drilling a hole, using scissors to cut a hole, or maybe it already has drainage, you know, naturally. <clears throat> I think we're doing pretty good on time. Does anybody have questions? Not a question, but a comment from Janet. She has a huge tomato right now that is producing lots of tomatoes. Um, okay. So she brings them in to ripen when they get big. And the plant is actually from 2021. So that's wow. pretty great, Janet. Yeah. It sounds like you are doing a great job in caring for it. Because <clears throat> in San Diego, wild tomatoes and even peppers are what we call an annual plant. And they usually die out. In the, in the off season, which for us would be the winter. In San Diego, if you care for them properly, give them enough nutrients, moisture, light, they can be perennialized. And perennial means that 
they'll uh, they'll continue to grow for several seasons. They might they might only produce in one season, but um, during the off season, generally the energy will go back down into their roots and then back up to their vegetation and flowers um, during the correct season. But that's pretty impressive if you're able to be able to do that. It's, it has um, taken over my yard a couple of times. That's very um, cool. And I have them in, I have it in a, just a small, not, well, it's not a big <laughs> pot, a terracotta pot okay. up against a fence. So I think it gets really warm. I have yeah. two pots like it with tomatoes also in them, but they seem to die out. So I'm wondering if it's just the different determinate or indeterminate. You, if your plant, plant is growing that I happen that, to have picked. Yeah, I think, I think so. It sounds like you had an indeterminate. And you, do you know what the varieties were? Do you remember their names? Um, I don't remember. I don't think I have the little sticks in there the anymore continues. either, but okay. I, you use a lot of um, compost in them. Okay. okay. Yeah. Feeding them um, is going to make a huge difference. Mm -hmm. And same with your, um, for someone who's a little bit more advanced gardener, if you want to try, if you get on a, a um, feeding schedule for your peppers and tomatoes year round, like in the winter, you'll cut them back. And then for your peppers, for example, cut them back and then feed them based on whatever fertilizer you're using. It'll give you the, um, on the back, it'll give you instructions. And um, you, if you do that, you could probably continue to grow your peppers throughout the year. They won't produce a lot of a lot of fruit, but they'll pop back and produce in the summer. So that's kind of fun. Um, the tomatoes, are they red or are they yellow or orange? Um, they're red. <laughs> when I, um, like I said, I bring them in when they get to um, a reasonable size, I bring them in and put them in the windowsill. Otherwise I have a big Heimlich ner uh, worm, like from bugs <clears throat> who starts to eat it. Okay. We also have rabbits. Um, and I think a couple of rats, unfortunately. Oh. Um, and so I kind of bring them in just to let them ripen in the house. They're not as, they're not as good as the summer ones, but they are pretty good. Okay. Yeah. And, and they probably, they might even become a little bit sweeter, um, in the summer. So mm -hmm. you might find that this time of year, they're, they're not as good, but, but they might taste very different when they have the heat in the sun, the sun. Right. They taste, they taste pretty good. Just as not a, just not like the yummy, yummy in the summer. Yeah. Well, that's cool. It sounds like you've got a very strong green thumb naturally. Oh, uh, no. <laughs> My well, mother you, did. I do know that. Well, she passed it on. It's inherited. Yeah. <laughs> so you just didn't realize it. <laughs> it's inherited. Um, and then right. we do well, have a couple other questions in the okay. chat. Um, okay. One is, can you speak to raised bed gardens? Do you have any experience with that? Yeah. Um, for raised beds, it's very similar to container gardening. So when I start to talk about um, in a few minutes about the growing medium that we're going to use, a type of soil, it's going to be the same. <laughs> you want to think about <clears throat> creating <clears throat> space that um, allows for nutrients, moisture, and roots to move fluidly through it. So you wouldn't want to use, for example, soil from the ground because that tends to be a little denser and heavier. Um, what's nice about raised beds is if you have any issues with smaller pests, minus your rats and squirrels, um, sometimes it can be enough to, to deter them. Um, same with a lot of your, your insects. Um, for example, if you have a raised bed and you have snail problems, you can place um, a trail of cracked eggshells around the base of it and the snails won't go over that because it could cut them. Um, you could also get a copper tape that will go around the, the bed so the snails can't crawl up and there's a gardening copper tape that you can buy. So, so raised beds are nice alternatives to in the ground because you have a little bit more control. Again, if you have soil that, um, if you have soil that's contaminated, but let's, let's take it even further. Let's just say you're one of those yards that has soil, which is very common in San Diego, which is very clay heavy. Clay doesn't allow for drainage. It doesn't um, break down and provide nutrients as quickly. So sometimes it takes, it can take a long time to build that soil up if it's a clay-based soil. So your raised bed is a really nice option for that. 
And then you also, just as just like your containers, you want to make sure you're fertilizing frequently because those nutrients get absorbed and broke, broken down a lot quicker than maybe in the ground. You can also um, add more worms. You can have worms in your pots too, but you can add more worms to create that healthy, um, what I call um, microbiome in your, in your soil, in your um, raised bed. So those worms will help um, break down organic matter. And um, if you've ever heard of worm castings, it's essentially worm poop. Um, it's like a, it's like a, a type of fertilizer. Um, I would say it's, um, it, it's, 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 an, it's very nutrient dense. And so it's adding back to the soil as those worms essentially poop in your soil. So, so they'll eat anything that you put in there. And, and, and we call that in the gardening realm, we call that black gold. You know, it's, um, it's very valuable and sought after for your garden. <laughs> so you'll see even worm casting sold at uh, your local nursery. So um, was there any specific question you had about raised beds? <clears throat> That's a very general answer I gave you. But, but for the most part, for that raised bed, it's going to be very similar to the strategies you use for a container garden. That's great. And then one last question in the chat was, do you have recommendations for growing roses in a plastic pot? Oh, man, that one I, I can't speak to because I'm not an expert in roses, and I'm very sorry. We have, um, as master gardeners, though, if you want to find a speaker for roses, we have several people who are very knowledgeable in roses. <laughs> and they can they can speak to roses and unfortunately my area of expertise is is um vegetables so I, i'm not as familiar and, and that's a whole whole nother like huge area of gardening that has um information that's very different than what it would be for for most other um, plants you're going to grow they're very specific so my apologies um, any other questions or, or do you want me to elaborate on the raised bed? Okay. Uh, let's see. So choosing your location. Uh, my first suggestion, suggestion to people is to choose a space that's close to your house. Because what happens sometimes is we get really excited about growing something, growing food, having a garden, growing flowers, ornamentals. And we want to choose what we think the best growing space would be for them. But if it's far from a water source or we have to walk out a little bit farther every day, it might it might turn out that, you know, it, it's it's not very convenient for us. And over time, we might lose interest. And so that's when you might see your garden be less successful than you had hoped for. So choosing a location that's super convenient, close to you, accessible. Uh, sunlight's important. Most vegetables and herbs want six hours or more. <clears throat> you can grow in partial shade for your leafy greens. Most leafy greens will do just fine with maybe four hours of sunlight, of direct sunlight. So um, your winter vegetables grow a little bit better as well because they don't need as much sunlight. Your summer vegetables tend to want more sunlight. So I try to find a place that you know gives you six hours of sunlight, of direct sunlight. And you can actually... Um, if you go out in the morning and, and watch when that sun starts to hit that space, and if you're home throughout the day, just observe when does that when does the sun um, move out of that space. So you can kind of get a sense for how much time it spends in that area. Um, some people, they go as far as putting like a, um, a camera out there, a video camera, and they're able to record. So if they're not home during the day, they can get a sense of how long it's there too. I don't have the equipment to set up for that, but if you do, that's a very convenient way to go too. Um, let's see, water, we talked about that. You wanna be close to a water source, especially if you're doing container gardening. Um, I have some on my patio and it's just, I find that because I have to go all the way into my kitchen, I have to fill up buckets of water or watering cans and come out that I've now um, drastically reduced the number of plants I have on my balcony because I find that it's just, it's a lot of work. Um, where my garden downstairs is right next to my hose and I'd rather just go ahead and use my hose and water it rather than putting my my um, edibles up on my balcony. So that's something that I learned over time just through trial and error. 
and then space. You have, you don't have a lot of space to grow, but you can utilize that vertical space. Please do. It's pretty amazing. You get very excited about the amount of food you can um, cultivate in such a small space. You can get, they have special woolly pockets that you can hang on a wall and grow out of. And, and you can look those up online. Um, they're very similar to like those shoe pockets that hang on a wall and you put your shoes in. And in fact, you can do that too. I've actually grown out of those, um, those, the shoe organizers. Um, again, with the shoe organizers, you want to make sure it's a fabric type material and not the plastic. So there's drainage. But yeah, you can use those woolly pockets, shoe pockets, um, your hanging baskets. I've also gotten um, those big Rubbermaid tubs and grown a bunch of things in it that were vining. And then I've, I've trellised them up my um, the posts on my balcony or along my fence. So that's another way to utilize space. If you're growing, you want to grow a lot of things in that raised bed, for example, grow your taller plants in the back along the fence, like maybe your peas or your beans so that you can trellis them up. And that's only going to take such a small space in your garden. You'll have plenty more space to grow more, more food, more items. Um, I always think in the back is, is the taller plants. Unless there's no back, no fence, then you want to consider Where's the sun, the direction from the sun? Because you don't want to plant where your sun is crossing over from east to west, right? You don't, um, you don't want to plant your taller plants where it would block out sun to the uh, shorter plants. There was a sense? question um, mm -hmm. as well. Um, they've read that there are certain veggies that are symbiotic, so so to speak, <clears throat> when planted closer together. Um, could you speak a little bit more about that? Yeah. So as a master gardener, I can't, um, I can't, when you say symbiotic, I can't say that necessarily they put something out that helps the other and they like, you know, they, they benefit each other in that kind of way. Cause some people do when they talk about companion planting, which is what that's called. Um, they'll say certain plants like to grow together and, and help each other out. Well, some of that is just, you know, it's, it's by trial and error and it's anecdotal. It's not grounded in science. So as a master gardener, I can only give that information. What I actually do on my own personal um, growing experience might be different. So I can't, I can't promote that. But what I can say as a master gardener is when we talk about companion planting, we do know certain plants like certain amounts of water, for example. <laughs> so if you have plants that are water loving plants, you should plant those together. Those are companion plants. You don't wanna plant something that prefers drier soil next to something that prefers wetter soil. So I can say that. Um, what I can say also is that there's certain plants that get are more susceptible to certain diseases like blight. So tomatoes, eggplant, and tomatoes are in what we call the Solanaceae family. And they, are, they have a, a tendency to get blight. So if you grow those three varieties next to each other and one of them does get blight, the, all of them are likely to get it. So they're maybe not the best companions. I might plant my tomatoes in a different area that I'm planting my eggplant or my peppers, just in case one of them gets a disease, it doesn't pass it to the other and wipe them all out. Um, when we talk about companion planting, uh, if you want to plant, do like successive plant, succession planting. So you have a taller plant but it has all this space underneath that you think, oh, hey, we could utilize that, you know, and you might grow a couple, several rounds of arugula under it. You know, you can, you, those you can say are symbiotic because the taller plant is actually providing a little bit of shade to those bottom leafy greens that might benefit from that because they don't like the intense sunlight. And then it's also providing space below to grow something smaller so that you're maximizing uh, your growing space. Does that make sense? The other, the other thing I'd like to say about being symbiotic is that um, beans, legumes, beans and peas, they have these little nodes at the bottom of their roots, which actually <laughs> help fix nitrogen in the soil. So that I can say that is grounded in science. So when you grow your beans in your garden, and there's several others you can, you can look up as well. Um, um, I think alfalfa might be one of them. There's different, there's different ones that farmers use, but, but what I, I think most gardeners use are, are legumes, but there's different, different plants that fix nitrogen in the soil. So that's a great plant to grow 
in your garden, especially if you have heavy feeders that will help help enrich your soil. So that's that's another another thing to consider. And then I guess let me make one more point now that I think about it. Also adding flowers that attract your pollinators. That that's also beneficial, right? Or symbiotic. Um because those flowers are bringing in your bees, your um, butterflies, your hummingbirds that are pollinating your fruit. So in the summer, that's especially important when you're growing tomatoes or peppers or eggplant or cucumber. <laughs> that's really important. So sweet alyssum brings in a lot of bees and pollinators. Um, a different kinds of sages can bring that in. Um, all your herbs, like your thyme, when it starts to flower, thyme has little tiny flowers and they'll bring in a lot of pollinators. Um, African blue basil, one of my favorites, it'll bring in tons of bees. Um, you could plant one African blue basil in your garden and you'll get a ton of bees. Same with borage. Borage, you can do the same. And with borage, which is, if you're writing it down, it's B-O-R-A-G-E. That one, the flowers are edible. So you can pull the little blue or white flowers off of them and put them in your salad and they're kind of sweet. They're really good. And then those plants also bring in your um, beneficial bugs, your carnivorous bugs, those that will um, eat or parasitize um, your bad ones. So the ones I, I mentioned, they bring in a lot of what we call our um, hoverflies or our um, beneficial they're 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 type of they call them wasps but they're not a wasp that stings us what they they do is they'll they'll just they're so small and they're and they'll hover over let's say um aphids and they parasitize and they'll they'll actually sting them and they lay eggs and um and you'll start to you'll see after time what looks like little carcasses from your aphids they're not they're not moving anymore they kind of look bigger and puffed up and hollowed out and and that's a really that's a good thing because your, your aphids are sucking the life out of your plants, the juices. So, so that's where I would say there's symbiotic or companion planting happening. <clears throat> I hope that's helpful. If you have any more questions about that, I'm happy to elaborate. All right. <clears throat> I think we're good on choosing a container. I think everyone should be comfortable with choosing a size. Um, again, feel free to tell me if there's any specific plants you want to grow, and I'm happy to tell you what kind of container to get. <clears throat> okay. If you are getting, if you're preparing a container that's from, um, it's an upcycled container, you want to make sure you thoroughly wash it um, and let it dry overnight with a little, with some hot soapy water. You could even put a tiny bit of bleach in there if you're someone that believes in that, um, and it just really want to kill any kind of um fungal disease that might be in there, bacteria, but you just want to make sure that you have a healthy container to start with. It's not going to contaminate your plant from jump. Um, if you're planting in that same container the next year, it's always a good idea. I always dump out the soil in my containers and, and, and it is a little more costly. So, so there's pros and cons to this, but I always dump out my, can, my soil somewhere where I can let the soil sit and rejuvenate um, in my yard and put new soil in. But before I do, I, I rinse out the container to make sure that any diseases that that plant might have caught the previous year aren't going to contaminate the next plant. So that's just setting you up for more success. But if, if budget is an issue, you can definitely still grow in that container. You might just try something that's not in the same family. So if you grew a tomato in that container the year before, I would not grow another tomato, pepper, or eggplant because they're susceptible to the same diseases. <clears throat> Um, for drainage, if you have a drill, you can use a half inch drill bit and drill <laughs> drill holes in um, plastic containers like your, your five gallon paint bucket. Um, I would definitely <laughs> put four or five holes in there, make sure there's plenty in there. I don't think you could have too many. Um, <clears throat> I think it's better that it drains and, and then um, water sitting below. If you can't, create drainage in your container. <clears throat> that doesn't mean you can't grow, but what it does mean is that you're gonna probably have more frequent shallow waterings, which isn't ideal, but if you really sit on that container, it's a really pretty one. You think aesthetically you'd like it in your space. 
<clears throat> you'd want to make sure that you put maybe um, gravel or rocks or something at the bottom that helps the water sit sit in that space rather than the roots sitting in it. Um, <clears throat> and you'll see what I'm talking about as we get a little bit further down and talk about preparing the soil and planting. For your soil, I, I always recommend buying potting soil, um, especially if you're a beginner. You can most definitely create your own potting soil mix, but that's gonna require purchasing several bags of different um, materials to make it, and it's gonna be more expensive. But if you like that, that's fun. It's an experiment, a science project for you. Um, this is a passion project of yours that you like to, to play with. Go for it and try it and see if you find a, um, a recipe that works for you. But what you wanna make sure is that there's plenty of, of nutrients in that soil, that there's medium in there that helps to create space for the plant so that it's not a dense, heavy soil because you don't want to have a situation where the nutrients and the moisture and the air can't easily move through the soil. So generally, if you buy a potting mix, those things have already been considered in that mix. And then I like to do half potting soil, half compost. So that compost, that's your organic matter. It's what feeds your plants. Um, you know, I, I work for the Boys and Girls Club and I work with lots of kids and they're under the notion that just the sun, you know, in uh, <clears throat> that, that that they produce enough, you know, um, nutrients from the sun. And, and that's not necessarily the case that the roots have to absorb certain vitamins and minerals um, that the sun can't provide the plant. Um, so, so definitely making sure that you have that healthy soil first and foremost, when it comes to the health of your plant, when it comes to mitigating any kind of pests, you know, any kind of pest management, Everything starts with the soil. Um, similar to like we think about our health, everything starts with what we put in our bodies, what we eat, right? So if we eat really well and we, we do clean eating and we have all the vitamins and nutrients we want, then we're likely able to fight off um, viruses, diseases, anything that comes our way. We're, we're, we're better prepared to fight that off. Same with <laughs> soil. Soil provides that base for the plants to get them that strong start. So definitely uh, make sure you bring in that compost. Planting your container. <clears throat> so again, the, it used to be when I created this document in 2011, there was a lot more push to put gravel at the bottom of your pots. They don't do that anymore. Um, however, they do suggest it if you don't have good drainage. So this is a strategy if there's not a lot of drainage. <laughs> I actually planted my raised bed because I don't have um, ground space with soil. So I planted it on top of um, a tile path. And the first time I planted it, I realized it really wasn't draining very well. So then I went back, pulled out all the soil and I put gravel at the bottom and then put the soil back in. And that was very helpful. Um, it created that space for the water to move and drain out. So same with your containers. If you can't get, if you really have your heart set on a container and you can't get drainage in it, put that gravel and make sure you're only doing shallow frequent watering so that the water's not sitting at the bottom and um, creating root rot for your plants. Um, and then again, you're going to want your potting mix, your seeds or your plant, um, water available and fertilizer. That's optional, but I always like to put a fertilizer in to start to give it a, um, a good boost. And for fertilizers, I can't really suggest a brand as a master gardener, but what I can say is that you can ask your local nursery what they like and what they recommend for what you're growing. And then there's instructions on the back of, of the fertilizer that will tell you um, if it's a new planting, if it's in the ground or if it's in a pot, it'll give you instructions um, for your growing conditions. <clears throat> um, for most plants, when you plant, they want to be um, planted as deep as the root ball. There are some exceptions. Tomatoes are the exception. For tomatoes, you can actually plant them the depth of two thirds of the plant, which sounds crazy. And you won't always have that option in a pot because your pot might not be deep enough. But <clears throat> right here, if you're, if you're looking right here along this, this um, stem of this tomato plant, or I don't know if it's a tomato plant, but let's say it is, this little area will shoot out roots. So it's going to make a stronger tomato plant, a more viable tomato plant, 
Now, if you didn't plant that way, it'll still be great, but this will just produce more over time and be stronger. So what I recommend to people is to cut the leaves off on the lower two thirds of the, of the tomato plant <coughs> and plant it in a hole the depth of that space and cover it up and leave the top third portion of the tomato plant above the soil. That way you get all those healthy roots that set right around that space where that, that stem is. <clears throat> it sounds counterintuitive, but it's, it's the one exception of tomato plants. They love it. Another thing that I might provide for those who are a bit more advanced gardeners is that if you're planting um, <clears throat> beans, melons, or cucumbers, I highly recommend starting from seed if you want the best success. You can definitely grow them from seedling, but they don't like their roots to be disturbed at all. So if you plant the from seed and start that way, it's going to have a stronger root, root system than if you're pulling it out of a pot and putting it in the ground. Those roots get slightly disturbed. It's probably not going to be a real issue. Most of the time it's not. But I do think for best success, starting from seed is the best way to go. <clears throat> and then if you have with your tomato plants, peppers, or eggplant, if you pull, if you're using seedling and you pull it out of the pot and you notice the roots are very, what we call root bound, they're like very tightly wound around each other. You definitely want to tickle and loosen up those roots. Um, you feel like you might be damaging it, but you're not. They're going to continue to grow that way and not spread out and, and create a good root system. So if you tickle those a little bit, break them up a little bit, it allows those places where <clears throat> you, you separated them to grow outward and reach for nutrients and water and create a really strong root system. <clears throat> All right, we're getting to the end here. I think perfect timing. Watering. So you want to do slow, gentle waterings. Um, the reason why is if you think about it, if you put moisture on your face when you're really dry, you just put a ton on and start rubbing, you just see the moisture sit on the surface. But if you prep your face, put a little bit on, let it absorb and put on more. I think this is an analogy we all can be familiar with that that moisture absorbs into our skin. Similar with um, soil. If you pour, um, if you put water, you water your pot and it comes to the, to the, you know, the rim. <clears throat> It's um, sometimes it'll flow over, sometimes it doesn't best absorb, it doesn't really get to the bottom the way it would because you haven't prepared the soil at the deeper levels for, to, to wick that moisture. So I always like to do a little bit of watering, wait a second, let it absorb so that it gets to lower levels. And now it's prepared the soil that's deeper to absorb more water and go deeper. So then you go and you do another watering. Um, you can definitely, if, if you've got really great drainage, water till you see a little bit of that water come out of the bottom of the pot if you're not sure how much to give it. That's a good, in, um, it's indicative of, of a good watering. Again, you need to make sure you have good drainage if you do it that way because you want to make sure all that um, water does get out of the pot. Morning and evening are the best times to water. And the reason is because in the middle of the day, the sun can be really intense. And so if you're watering at that time, it can absorb a lot of the moisture your plant needs. It can also burn the plant because water can carry that, that heat. So it's best to do morning and evening <clears throat> and you wanna avoid getting the leaves wet. And I know when it rains, leaves get wet and that's great, <clears throat> but you wanna do it as little as possible because we do have certain fungal diseases that carry like spores that carry in the air. And when the plant is wet, it can attach to that a little bit easier. So you'll find that you might spread more um, disease in the garden if you're getting the plant leaves wet. For fertilizing, <clears throat> that one, I can't really give a set plan for. Again, that one is very dependent upon the fertilizer you choose. So for that one, when you go to the store and buy a fertilizer, if you're growing tomatoes and vegetables, make sure you get one for tomatoes and vegetables. If you're growing pansies and flowers, make sure you get one for those types of flowers. If you're growing a citrus, you know, dwarf citrus tree in a pot, make sure you get fertilizer for citrus. They have a different combination of nutrients that they need. And then on the back of that, of that container, it will tell you again how much to use for the type of plant, how much to use if it's in the ground or in a pot, if it's a new start or an established plant, it'll give you those directions. <clears throat> and then lastly, the soil moisture test <clears throat> is you wanna stick your finger in 
And you really should be able to stick your whole finger into the soil and feel that it, <laughs> feel that it's damp and um, like a cool feeling. That cool, damp feeling means that your soil is getting um, the amount of moisture that it most likely needs. Um, it sh if you picked up some of the soil and you put it here and you squeezed it, it should feel like a wrung out sponge. If you're still not sure with the finger test, because I don't know, maybe maybe your, your plant is very root bound and it's really not getting down to the bottom like you thought it might be, but that top, that top soil is still moist. So it's a little bit um, deceiving. You can buy at a nursery, they have water gauges that are, they're pretty long and you stick the water gauge down into the soil as far as it can go. And it has um, a little meter that will tell you where, where it is um, moisture wise. And that is it. I think that's um, that's all the information you need to get a really good start. And I definitely would like to open it up to any kind of questions or suggestions or tips. Well, I don't have a question, but I do wanna say this has been very helpful for me. I'm not a very experienced gardener and I very much appreciate <laughs> the detail you gave us. The handout is wonderful. I took great notes based on all that you said to us. So. Thanks so much, Summer. Absolutely. I'm happy to do it. And like I mentioned, I also have, I can speak to um, monarch butterflies if anybody wants to learn more about raising monarch butterflies in their, in their yard. So, um, and there's lots of other wonderful topics that other master gardeners are talking about too. So, yeah. I hope it was beneficial for everyone. Um, just enough information for those that, that are beginners, but also not or not too much information for beginners, but just enough for those a little more advanced too. I have a question. Um, thank you again. That was a great presentation. Um, I have raised beds in the back of my yard and um, now I need to bring in some soil. So it's a pretty big area. I don't want to buy like bags. Is there like, can I go somewhere where there's dirt or whatever and have a, you know, a, not a truckload, but you know, quarter of a load or whatever brought in and put that in there? You can. Um, I, so this is, gets tricky. I, so I didn't say this because <laughs> as a master gardener, I cannot, I cannot um, promote any businesses, mm -hmm. but a place that I, I sometimes have gone to, I used, I used to help people in their gardens, but prior to this job and um, teach them how to grow food. And um, I know city farmers nursery has a program where you can buy it by the yard and they'll deliver it for a fee, or you can pull your pickup truck there and they'll put it in the back of your pickup truck. Oh, um, yeah. yeah. The County, I think gives out free, if not re very reduced rates for um, compost because they have a composting program. And I think that when you do have to pick it up, but I know for a lot of the community gardens, people go out there and get a truck full of compost I want to say it's free, but I can't remember. Just if not, it's a very, very reasonable price. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? I'm not seeing anything in the chat. I'm looking through, <laughs> okay. through the list. Um, but if there are no questions, I'd like to repeat Shirley's thanks. Uh, for this wonderful presentation. I, I learned a lot myself as someone who is also just beginning. So thank you once again for joining us today. Absolutely. Thank you for the invitation, Shirley. Thank you for connecting. Um, I, I love sharing this. It's, 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 I mean, I don't know if you can tell I'm very passionate about it and I would like to see more people um, in, in urban areas, especially utilizing these resources and growing food and greening their spaces, but also just, um, you know, being present and it's therapeutic, you know, it's being present, it's, it's connecting back with nature. Sometimes we forget how easy it is to connect with nature when we live in urban landscape. So I wish you guys all the best. I hope you have a good time and a lot of success and happy gardening. Great. Thank you so much. <laughs> all right. Well, have a wonderful um, afternoon, everyone, a wonderful day. And um, Vanya, thank you again for um, coordinating the um, the Zoom piece of this. Great to meet you. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.